Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about Blade Runner, the 1982 Ridley Scott film based on the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, writer Trisha Arand. Hello, everybody. Writer Brian Bittner. Hello. And editor Alex Cayetos. Hi. So Blade Runner is a very old video, which is, it's really weird how there are old videos now that mm-hmm. continues to surprise me. Uh, but watching it again, it was, it reminded me of the time before I'd kind of locked down the style of the channel. And I remember wanting to talk about Blade Runner because the new one was coming out, Blade Runner 2049, and really wanting to talk about film noir because I love film noir. Um, and I can't say it. <laughs> Without it's two syllables uh, immediately in your mind. upon releasing the video, the first comments were like people spelling out the words N O dash R and like, <laughs> why is he saying it? No R. But that's just how I say it. Also, technically, the plural of film noir is it's actually films noir, but mm. I decided that, that was a little bit too that'd be a little weird. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I love Blade Runner. Because I love sci-fi and I love noir, and it is such an amazing example of those two things. It was the first example of those two things. Uh, and it's it's one of those movies where every time I go back, I've, I've seen it a million times, and the plot still doesn't really make sense. Like, I can't justify that it's a good movie in a lot of ways, but I love it, and I can't take my eyes off it. Mm-hmm. And it just continues to be one of my favorite films for that reason. Yeah, I think I think for me, it's like maybe my favorite movie of all time in terms of <laughs> like tone and mood and production design. Well, you should light. tell people how you look right now, Brian. <laughs> oh, like, yes. like, oh, right. That's got to be brought up. Well, okay. My girlfriend and I are, uh, we're Roy and Pris for Halloween because it is November, 2019. We're mm-hmm. in Los Angeles. Um, and if you know how I look, I make a better Leon than a Roy, but it's Halloween. So <laughs> do what I want. Um, and, uh, and I'm still blonde because we are going to other Blade Runner themed events <laughs> during the month. So now I just look like somebody who should not be blonde. Who is blonde? I don't know. You're kind of pulling it off. <laughs> yeah, you're totally but, pulling it off. Yeah. Like it. But no, I, I just like I would say like Lord of the Rings is up there. Maybe seven. Just movies where just everything about it feels rich and immersive mm-hmm. and emotionally like r- romantic, not in the love sense, but in the just like this this movie is bleeding with mm-hmm. emotion and Decadent. feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even as gross as it is, it's just like decadent in how like. Kind of, yeah, that the texture of it is so mm-hmm. like slick and like just kind of oily and dirty and and um yeah, like all of the rain, you know, it just feels it has all of this like tactile sort of thing where you when you watch it, you're just experiencing it with all of your senses, yeah. right? And it does, it engages with that where like one of the weirdly mo- scenes that I always remember about this movie, the way that people like eat and drink in it, like all of the alcohol, of course, which is very film noir, right? To just be constantly drinking booze, but then all of the food with like the noodles and the different, mm. like those textures and this, you know, the snake that she has and all of this stuff, it's just very sensual and it kind of just seeps into your skin where you kind of, yeah, it like puts you in a mood all day or like all week, even after you watch it. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Yeah. So this movie, and I think you even mentioned it in your video, Michael, where you know the first time you see Blade Runner, depending on your age, probably, it's a very strange movie, and it's it's if you're used to a typical plot driven, you know, kind of coherence <laughs> to a <laughs> to a film experience, it's very uh, disorienting, and yeah. you don't really know where you are or really what's happening at most moments or where the story is going right now. And it's more of like a dream. It's it's more of a mm-hmm. hazy dream state of a movie. And so I think I really first appreciated it when I saw it in theaters. I think when I first moved to LA, pretty early on, I saw an ArcLight screening. That's cool. And that's where it really clicked for me, where I was just so immersed in a good theater watching a good, you know, Mm -hmm. 4k copy of it. Mm -hmm. And it was, that's where it really struck me how remarkable this movie is as far as just having kind of ahead of its time, like density to it. There's, there's, it's, there's so much in it. Every frame is so dense. That's almost part of the disorientation. And Mm -hmm. the reason why it's almost confusing and hard to watch the first couple of times is because there's so much in it. It's, it's like, you see other movies or a lot of we've 
talked about this recently in our Patreon exclusive <laughs> Dark Fate episode, which you can listen to. But I've had a problem with a lot of, you know, sci-fi blockbuster mm-hmm. movies recently where it doesn't feel like there's this attention to detail or mm. care or world building or you know, there's there's nothing there that feels like it's lasting or that I would get anything more on a repeat viewing. Like I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of movies I see now that have this kind of budget where I, I know on the first viewing I saw everything there was to see mm-hmm. and there's really no more to get if I watched it again. And Blade Runner is like the exact opposite of that, where the first time I almost get nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what just happened or what I just saw, but there was something happened. And on repeat viewings, like I was just rewatching it before this podcast. And I'm like, this shot is in this movie. I've seen this movie several times, mm-hmm. but I don't remember this shot. And this yeah. shot is really stunning and spectacular. Yeah. How do I not remember this? And I think it's because there's just so many. Yeah, every shot looks so, like There's that. so many set pieces and mise-en-scene and things that are just so dense that your brain can't store it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a really remarkable movie in that way. Even if I'm not in love with it the way I'm in love with some other films, I I respect that I can watch it kind of infinitely and still absorb new like data from it. It's stylistically overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Like yes. when you just think about that opening sequence and just the scope of the city and the scope of the world and how carefully drawn every single part of it is. You're just like, I don't even know where to look right. on this screen almost. Your eye feels and you're being, confused. Yeah, and yeah. that score is like zoom, <laughs> like in through your ears. It's it's crazy. Which it's someone wonderful. someone did make a video called uh, the opening scene of Blade Runner, but it's actually Los Angeles, November 2019. Uh, <laughs> because if you don't know, LA is kind of a little bit on fire right now. Uh, <laughs> oh, that, so it's that just, would make for a good it's video. It's drone shots of LA on fire oh, <laughs> and with the opening music. Yeah. I want to see that. Yeah, I, I feel like dense is such a good word mm-hmm. for it. Because, yeah, there, there's just so much in it. And it's, it's, it's kind of funny because this movie and Alien are kind of two of my favorite movies, mm-hmm. especially from this time period. Both Ridley Scott and both very difficult productions where like the story of making the movie is mm. almost as fascinating if not more fascinating than the movie themselves and it, it was just so interesting you know the the special features for both these movies but Blade Runner especially really go into detail and you kind of follow this journey that Ridley Scott was on of trying to create this thing and pack all this stuff in but the technical limitations and the budgetary limitations and them going over and trying to figure out how to do things and there was no time and the last shots of the movie they were like racing to get before the sun came up and it was just like well we're pulling your funding tomorrow so like you better go film it and like that's when tears in the rain happened like there's just so much like (laughs) magic that came out of this crazy production and it's i feel like that adds like you can just feel it when you watch it so much was put into the movie well there's all that tension which you know i know that a lot of it too is like the performance obviously harrison ford's performance and ridley scott not getting along uh really disagreeing about the way that they saw the character and so there's there's this tension simmering underneath which is kind of what you want for like any film noir. (laughs) You want there to be all of this. You don't want to ever feel relaxed in a scene um, or just like you talked about this in the video, Michael, but just like the pessimism Mm -hmm. and the sense of sort of doom, like film of death. Right. It feels that way. And I think it's because you can get the sense like nobody was having fun (laughs) on the (laughs) Blade Runner set, you know, and I'm not saying that, we touched on this when we were talking about The Shining. Mm-hmm. It's like it, just having a miserable film production doesn't automatically mean that your movie is going to be full of menace or tension or whatever. But in this case, I do think it kind of bleeds into the whole experience of watching it. Right. Like it weirdly fits the genre. And like Harrison Ford not really getting along with what's her what's her name the actress that played Rachel Sean Young, Sean Sean Young. Young. Yeah. thank you yes like that tension and her being so young and it's like her first film and like yeah you know, like there's just like you said there's so much tension in every part of it but it really works for this genre and it, it's weird because one of the things I, I like about film noir is that it, it is very pessimistic and dark and dirty but somehow there's like beauty in it and there's usually some kind of little thread of optimism i don't know there's there's something i like that it's it's combined it combines this dark view of this of the world with like some romanticism like for there to be something dark there has to be someone or something that believes in the light Mm. and i just i really like that dichotomy and i feel like blade runner has 
so much of that, like the replicants, like fighting for life and like trying to, you know, be more human to the humans ultimately than the humans are to them. And just, I just love how the themes, it's just, it's just such a nice mixture of all these things. It's a little bit of a tangent, but I just love that movie. No, that no, no. So it's... much fun. So I've known Michael for a long time and I feel like a lot of something's clicking right now. I'm like, why, why is Michael so into noir? Like, why is noir like his thing? But I feel like you always have had kind of like that dark romantic streak in you. And it, it totally makes sense thinking about it. Like the idea of this this art form that is like inherently, you know, very, I think it is very pessimistic in a lot of ways but it's also romantic about the pessimism. It's like luxuriating. <laughs> uh -huh. It's luxuriating in the yeah. pessimism. And, and like you said, it's decadent. Mm -hmm. It's like, if we're going to be pessimistic about the future, let's be decadent. We're going I mean, all I, the way. Yeah, let's I would, be decadent I would, about it. I would say that's how Seven is too. Um, yes. Which I just feel like, I don't, yeah. I don't think Seven and Blade Runner are similar movies, but they feel like similarly mooded, you know, and sort of, right. again, that sort of like the decadence of the, of the sort of, uh, yeah, pessimistic, rainy, dark, like just it feels wrong, but also I like being here and I don't know why. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's the pros of, and I don't know if any of you guys have read a lot of like classic noir, um, like Chandler and Dashiell mm -hmm. Hammett and those guys, or, you know, sort of our American like signposts when we're talking about noir. The pros of those books, they're very um, lavish in the way that they, oh, Actually, that's not even the word that I'm looking for, because what we're talking about here is not something that's like flowery or elaborate necessarily, but it is sharp. And mm. I don't know. I just love I read it. I've read like basic. I'm a huge Chandler fan. And um, on the back of The Long Goodbye, the copy of The Long Goodbye that I have, which is my favorite novel of his, it's his last novel. It just, instead of doing blurbs or anything like that, they just published a whole paragraph mm -hmm. from the book. And it it's the one that starts off, there are blondes and there are blondes. And then it goes into like all of these different kinds of like the blondes, you know, um, like the ice blondes and the different, it's so good. So it it is, it's, it's exploring all of these facets of our psychology and like sort of what attracts us to this like darkness. It's, it gets into the very thing that we're talking about in its very form. Mm -hmm. which is fascinating and uh, Blade Runner is perfect at that. <laughs> Once again, watching Blade Runner again just today, looking at the cinematography and how many shots of just human faces are so gorgeous yeah. in this movie that also has shots that are very, you know, literally filled with visual garbage, you know, mm -hmm. like like in, in this movie that is putting you in this underworld kind of setting, it also is willing to have these beautifully kind of colored, you know, colored light shots where people are bathed in blue or red. And and I, I realized watching it again, how much um, the sequel, 2049, takes that inspiration and kind of takes it further yeah. with, the, with the boldness with color. But it, yeah, it just, it, once again, it, it's amazing how beautiful a dirty cyberpunk movie can look. And that's that's part of the contradiction, which is so fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and the word that we're I think we're all probably looking for is chiaroscuro, right? Which is darkness and light. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's, it's my favorite kind of yeah, yeah painting style. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's that it's that Italian um, Caravaggio. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's the visual language that noir, our noir film borrows from. You know, the old black and white. It is exactly that. It's those harsh stripes, the bars from the windows, and stuff like that. And so. That's exactly the the theme, right, as well. It's that thing that you're talking about, that like one optimistic or that childlike belief in something despite all of the garbage that it's buried in. Um, it's all oh, really good. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I was thinking about it, watching it, kind of going back to what you were saying, Alex, and I, I feel like kind of the fundamental differences between us and, and, and some of our, the, the artsy, parts of film that we relate uh -huh. to and and i was thinking about like you know a movie like for your life or like the new world and how i can watch it and kind of like intellectually be like well yeah it's pretty like it's their sun through like grass and like nature's nice i guess but like it doesn't affect me <laughs> like I, this I, is his reaction to malik <laughs> i'm gonna call terrence malik and tell him what you said 
<laughs> that's, that's to be I fair, that's the one. casual moviegoer's reaction to Malik, sure, which is sure. like, this looks nice, but it's been two hours. <laughs> or three. Yeah. Sorry, oh, no, I'll, it's, I'll get it's been that. two hours and I'm still waiting for something to happen. Uh, yeah. Yep. I feel like Blade Runner is like the same thing. Like, I think right. you sit down and watch that with a casual moviegoer and mm-hmm. they're like, this is long and boring and what's happening and I don't understand. That's how I felt the first time I saw it, right. whenever that was. But uh, yeah, I feel like for whatever reason that I need that darkness in order to allow right. the beauty to shine through. Or yeah. to pre- and for some reason that, and I think Seven is another great example of that where like like Seven is filled with disgusting horrifying imagery. Yes. Some and of it's, the worst images that very, have ever entered my brain. it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Like I will watch that over and over again. There's just something about it that's like the, there is beauty in this. It's funny since we're talking about light and the darkness, one of my favorite things that just gets me every time and it's so stupid or it should be stupid is like they're just in a dark apartment and then the light comes in through the window mm-hmm. from like the blimp passing by or whatever mm-hmm. it is and it just looks gorgeous and it's, it's one of those things that makes the movie feel like it's in the the fourth dimension or something like I just feel mm-hmm. like oh there's more happening beyond the edge of the frame of the camera and it, it literally is the light coming into the dark so um yeah well, that's not it, stupid yeah and it reinforces but it should be stupid that uh, like a light coming a through light, the window right. makes me go like this is awesome <laughs> it's part of the texture that we're talking about and it reinforces this like urban this really well realized urban vision of Los Angeles mm. where there's constant activity. There's people everywhere. It's so crowded. You like almost can't breathe in some ways. And there's all of these, you know, there's the cars everywhere on the street, in the air. There's no space that is freed from that activity or that is like removed from that activity so much so that you can get a moment's peace without a light coming in through the window. And I think it, again, every bit of it is just meticulously crafted to create that world it's pretty brilliant i mean and it's interesting too i i'd be curious to hear from you guys when the first time you saw blade runner had you seen a lot of other film noir like did Um, you have a visual reference for what it was that you were watching it's hard for me to remember actually when i first saw it because i'm pretty sure my dad probably would have showed it to me at some point but i can't i don't know how much film noir reference i had in my head or if i was told or made mm. conscious of the fact that this is essentially a film noir in a cyberpunk setting right so probably not yeah I, yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure i had seen like double indemnity and big sleep and that kind of stuff but i didn't watch blade runner going oh it's film noir like i just mm-hmm. watched blade runner going oh, it's a it's this movie you know right it's that's the kind of thing you don't necessarily appreciate yeah i i think my answer is exactly what you're getting at which is i think i saw it at like maybe the very beginning of college and was like what is this i don't understand and then i went through film school and took a class in noir and fell in love with noir and then came back to blade runner i also then saw the final cut which is we can talk about that Uh all the different versions but then coming back to it i feel like that's when i like really appreciated what it was because i did have this reference point that amplified all the things that made me excited about it yeah it when you find yourself even with just like a basic grounding in some of the traditions that this is borrowing from and the language that this is utilizing you do appreciate it that much more so the first time i saw it i was just like this movie's pretty and it's kind of exciting and whatever but now because you know having become the huge crime fiction fan that i am and all this stuff it's like it, it just it's brilliant like it's perfect <laughs> i would venture to say well talking about the different versions and talking about film noir i think i've only ever seen the final cut mm-hmm. uh and i i understand what the differences are but i thought you know what I'm, I'll, I'll sit down and watch the theatrical sometimes it's hard to watch a different cut of movie if you've only seen it once or twice because you don't remember that mm-hmm. but i just watched blade runner a month ago to prepare for Halloween. So um, I was like, I'll watch the theatrical cut. And, you know, it's mostly the same movie, like uh, the it, it, the general look and feel of it. But it has that voiceover, which... Oof. But uh-huh. here's the interesting thing. I It's bad. Like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but, like, talking about the film noir, and especially when they're based on these books with this sharp writing... A voiceover is not only a filmic choice, but it's also a way to get that writing into the into the script, yeah. you know, into yeah. the movie. And the interesting thing about the Blade Runner, because if Blade Runner is film noir, having the main character tell voiceover, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Like that makes so much sense. And it does actually fill out a bit of the story. Like, you know, you know nothing about Gaff in the final cut. Right. And that story fills out a little bit of who he is. And, you know, you don't need to know, but it's interesting. It's world building. 
But the interesting thing is neither Hampton Fancher nor David Peoples wrote that dialogue. It was just right. written by like the producer or something. And then they just sort of like held a gun to Harrison's Ford head and said, read this. Truly. You know? And he like half-assed it because he was like, there's no way we're going to ever use this. Right. So right. You, like, you can tell in the performance, I think, how much right. he does not care about Gaff this. had been there and he'd let her live. <laughs> <laughs> I quit because I had had a belly full of killing. Like... It's it's not written for the Oof. movie. It's written for some <laughs> like, other. Yikes. In the behind the scene, like when they're going through the whole making of and getting that process, they like play like unedited, like the recordings of him saying it. And he like goes in and he tries to say the line of, you know, like Rachel did this, blah, blah, blah. This is so dumb. And <laughs> like, you can just hear him like in between takes like, That's awesome. railing against how stupid this thing is. <laughs> so it's an interesting thing where it's like the idea of it makes perfect sense, you know? And like, it, it's almost unfortunate that that Ridley Scott and the screenwriters weren't on board with the idea of it and said, okay, if that's what we want to do, let's do it. Obviously it's better without that voiceover. Would it be better or as good with a better voiceover? Maybe, I don't know. I could see it working. Well, it's that whole thing of like, you are starting with a visual language and in a tradition, but they are making something completely new. You don't want to just make the same thing that you have been making. You know, we can get into this more, but like, Film noir came out of a very specific time period. And so the like fears as, you know, the fears, the like, urban sort of, you know, police corruption and crime and all of this stuff that was happening came out of the depression and, and that when, when those novels were written and then when that film language grew out of the, the literary genre that was being created. And then in the 1980s, the 70s and 1980s, you have a totally different social landscape. So you don't want to tell that exact same kind of story. You want to push it and blend it into a new genre. And so thinking about what you were saying earlier, Brian, or rather right before we sat down and started recording, we were like, we need some saxophone playing. <laughs> and I was like, we don't actually, because that's not what this score is. And there are very clear choices here to depart from a classic noir and make this. Oh, there's sci-fi. saxophone in the score. Oh, okay. The, tr- the track is called Blade Runner Blues, and it was I think oh, it was playing right yeah. before. Yeah. yeah, I've listened to the score many, many times. Okay. <laughs> but there is so, a lot of synth, right. but like, it is not sax- new version. Right, exactly. Yeah, it yeah, is yeah, not yeah. saxophone based. I think the score is a perfect blend of what you're talking about, yes. sort of taking yeah, yeah. inspiration from the old thing, but not trying to replicate that old thing. Exactly. And it is interesting. Again, we were just talking about Dark Fate last night, patron exclusive episode. Check it out. Uh, <laughs> But I feel like this is such a good example of, of <laughs> that was an, an example of what not to do. And I feel like this is a good example of what to do where it's it's making it new and it's updating it. But it, it's also and maybe it's just the circumstances, but they're able to take this fatal, you know, dark versus light thing from the 20s and the 40s and the original film noir update it so it felt resonant with what culture was at the time and build it into sci-fi where it's also about like robots and humans and what is humanity and that i feel like somehow this updated version of this genre fit so well in this new genre in this time period and it's kind of miraculous that it it Neo all came together like that. Or cyberpunk. Yeah. Yeah, you could call it. It's also coming off the tails of something like uh, Taxi Driver, yep. which is sure. like 70s noir of like, oh, if this was what bad stuff looked like in the 30s, this is what bad stuff looks like in the 70s, you know, just mm-hmm. taking it to the next level. Well, and that's why Chinatown, I think, sure. was so resonant Absolutely. at the time. Like some of that stuff that people were still going through um, continued to be, you know, it was able to be accessed in a very specific way by filmmakers in the 70s and early 80s. And so that it's no shock that Blade Runner came out of that, just that it remains as like gorgeous and if relevant feeling today um, because the fears that it is operating on or like in that space were very unique to the time period. But then the human story at the heart of it is timeless, I think. And so it's interesting when you watch Blade Runner 2049, the sort of like sociological fears are totally different. You know, when you look at it, it doesn't actually take place in urban settings as much. And there's like that like um, wasteland of the junkyard. And then, of course, Vegas, which is amazing in Blade (laughs) Runner 2049, that entire sequence. That's operating in a very different like space in terms of like sociological paranoia. But the human story is able to continue because of what they were able to access with the characters in this movie. Well, I think what's interesting with Blade Runner 2049 is that climate change is really front and center as far as the new 
dystopian paranoia. Yes. You know, it it's very present just in the mise en scène in the way that other ideas are present in the mise en scène of the original movie. Exactly. Just all the all the settings from the giant seawall to the to, to the way Vegas mm-hmm. is, where it's just a kind of a weird dusty wasteland. Dust bowl. Yeah, dust bowl. Basically. Yeah. And that's actually something Hampton Fancher wanted to uh focus on a little bit more in his script and then he got fired and replaced with David Peoples, which it's really interesting to hear Hampton Fancher in November 2019 talk about that and say like I hated that I got fired and I hated some of the choices they made but then when I I finally came around to it and I realized and like Ridley and I are friends and it's like a very humble thing to be able to say they ripped me out of this project and it was the right choice you know Philip K. Dick didn't like it either Mm. for a long time until he got to see some of it you know right so go ahead so Hampton Fancher (laughs) wanted to wanted to um adapt this Philip K. Dick novel uh and he didn't know how to contact him because it's Philip K. Dick sure yeah even Dick's agent was like I don't know where he is (laughs) (laughs) so Hampton Fancher's walking down the street runs into Ray Bradbury sure right oh my god (laughs) And it's like, hey, I want to do this thing. Do you happen to know this guy, Philip K. Dick? He goes, sure. Here's his number. <laughs> Perfect and amazing. Which, so it's like the most like meta, like yeah. that sounds like Philip K. Dick logic in it real life. It truly does. That's amazing. Wow. That's also very LA though, actually. Right. Yeah. And I think I remember reading that Philip K. Dick, like you're saying, did eventually come around to it. And once he saw some yeah. of the images, was like, oh my God, you took this out of my brain somehow. Like somehow this is exactly what I was picturing. That's great. I didn't it's, know that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's pretty crazy. The book is really interesting. And I feel like one of the weird things, it was interesting finally reading the book because I read it before doing the video. And so I'd seen Blaine Rutter a bunch of times. And then I finally read the book. And there are there are weird, there are things that feel like leftovers from the book that like get a couple lines here and there in the movie that don't really add up to anything in the movie, but are big deals in the book. Like mm-hmm. all the... Uh, like the animals and the fake animals and are they real animals or yeah not? that's a huge part of the book right and so it's weird that they still even reference that in the movie because it doesn't go anywhere but in the books it's there's so much of it so it, it was weird reading it because i felt like there was a lot that felt very faithful and then there was like a hard line and everything on the other side of the line was completely jettisoned and or like in the book, he has to uh, hunt down one of the replicants is an opera singer. And then in the movie, she's a stripper with a snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of, yeah. yeah, it's almost the same. Yeah. <laughs> Should we talk about the script? <laughs> I mean, we've kind of been touching on it a little bit, but. So here's my thing with Blade Runner. I feel like I like I love everything about it almost besides the script. OK, like, this, okay. like I mean, no, there are like actually. I shouldn't say that there are there's some really wonderful dialogue and scene like scene construction that I really enjoy in this movie. But it's interesting. And maybe this is just also the filmmaking and the choices in the filmmaking and the, and the editing even. But I feel like it's a movie that almost is like trolling me sometimes <laughs> with how it's like denying me uh, like access to cle- to keep plot points. Mm-hmm. Like when I should know things, it's like almost managing to give it to me in the least um, what's the word? I feel like key plot points are said in a way that I need subtitles to understand and okay. are not shown visually at moments. And there's parts of this movie I never understood from a plot perspective until I watched it with subtitles. Interesting. Because I, there's visual language is being used to show you the incredible textures of the world. But then things happen off screen or are said almost in an offhand line that are like very important plot information that I never understood or I missed or I was looking at something. And so I didn't hear what somebody off screen said, you know. So it's it's just a fascinating movie where it doesn't seem to care if I know like really key plot information at any given point. It's all there and it's all there for you to find. But it, I just I find it fascinating how it's deprioritized almost in service of we're not going to really worry about if you got that or not. We're going to just keep moving on. And here we are now in this other place and who knows what's happening, mm-hmm. but it's beautiful. Again, it's, it's yeah. why the idea of a voiceover isn't terrible, right? It just was executed, you know, terribly, <laughs> but like the idea of that, except the funny thing about the voiceover is some parts of it are filling in so much of the world and some parts of her like skin jobs. That's what they called replicants. It's like, <laughs> uh, no, I, I got that. Right. Yeah. yeah there, no, some things are very clear. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And, and all none of this is saying that that 
it should be any different right. because now I do appreciate this movie exactly as it is. And it's not for the, like, I don't watch it for the plot or for like, for being really compelled by the underlying plot moment to moment. It's I'm compelled by something else. And just, it, that's what it does. It makes it feel a little dangerous and, and, you know, something about it that I think about like every time, the first time I listened to a David Bowie album, I'm like, what is this? And then like, <laughs> right. the, the fifth time I listened to it, I'm like, I love this. And then I never, ever get sick of it. And I think, right. I, I don't even remember the first time I watched Blade Runner. I remember watching mm. it for like the third time and just suddenly clicking and like kind of knowing I just wanted to watch this movie forever Forever. basically yeah (laughs) well it's kind of like 2001 a space odyssey or or a lot of these movies that like the traditional first viewing especially if you're a kid is like what (laughs) what what i just see because this (laughs) is not giving me the things that i'm expecting from a traditional movie but they're so rich upon repeat viewings i will say having a driven protagonist with a clear goal kind of covers a multitude of sins truthfully like Because we don't necessarily, we can't always follow why he's going here or why he's going there or like there are a lot of these like really tertiary characters that are hard to keep track of and all of this stuff. We don't necessarily know how they factor in, but he does. So you're willing to just watch Decker do his job, even if you can't exactly follow his logic about like, well, what did he see in that picture that he enhanced a thousand times? Like, <laughs> and like went around a corner <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in the 2D image. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 So like, you, you don't need to know that necessarily. It's just that you see it click for him. And that's like very classic detective stuff where like the detective goes, Oh, you know, and you have no idea what he just realized, but you're going to, you understand he just had some kind of insight and he's going to go pursue a new lead now. And you're just kind of willing to watch him do that. And I, I think this movie operates in that space really effectively. I'm thinking about The Big Sleep yeah. as you're saying that, which yes. I think is famous. It's a for really being good like, reference for this. Yeah. Yes. Like, I love The Big Sleep. Me too. It's so much fun to watch. I have no, no idea, idea what's going on. <laughs> I don't think the plot even really makes sense and it doesn't really matter there's definitely one dead end in that plot with the chauffeur that ends up in the lake (laughs) like even someone someone finally asked chandler like who killed that guy he's like yeah i don't know (laughs) 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 but it it's great that movie is great and it's for this exact reason and yeah yeah, and and that's what the big lebowski does too which is based on the big sleep it's just Mm -hmm. like oh yeah the the plot of this doesn't matter at all it just like happens and then the movie's over yeah the big lebowski is a western noir which i just love the most love 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 so good yeah there's also something satisfying about a countdown which is whether it's seven or scott pilgrim or blade runner just this number of this is how many things have to happen Mm -hmm. and then it's over you know whether or not that thing happens or whether it happens in a different way than you were expecting just the fact that you're like at any given point, I know where I am in the mm-hmm. story. I feel like I have like a grasp on something. It's it's weird. It's so simple, but it works. Yeah. And they they keep track of it for you in dialogue. Mm-hmm. He's like, one down, three to go. Four. Wait, no, it's definitely three. Like they do that for you. And yeah, it just it's a simple device. Very effective. You can't do it in every movie. But. Yeah. That is really effective. I'm so I'm thinking also now about the different versions and you know the trying out of the voiceover, and I I think for people that want to learn more about filmmaking and storytelling, I think it is worthwhile to watch all the versions because I think them doing this process is a very trying to fix a thing is a very educational process. Yeah, mm. and this is a movie where they tried multiple times to figure out what it could be and you can sit down and watch what if this movie had voiceover throughout like there aren't any other examples of movies where it's like what if this key component of this otherwise maybe perfect movie was changed radically and how does that affect the experience and how does that affect the way you receive the story like you're saying Brian you learn things about characters and so now you have this knowledge that you didn't have if you're watching this other version. And how does that play into what happens next and how you feel about all those things? And I feel, I feel like I resonate with this also because in high school, I tried to make a feature film uh, and the first pass was not good. And so we had to take it apart and figure out how to make it work and kind of work from the middle out and, and, trying, to, and trying to fix a thing you learn so, so much. And I think it's pretty cool that there's a classic film that has multiple versions where you can see the different things they tried 
and you can kind of judge for yourself what works and what doesn't work about them. Like that's actually a pretty awesome resource. Yeah, I agree. Especially because they're not it doesn't suck to watch any version of it. You know what right. I mean? It's yeah. like the movie. It's still, right. yeah. You don't have anything else to say about the script? Well, I'm kind of with do, Alex. Don't you? I don't know. Oh. I mean, I, I think one of the things that was interesting working on the video was I was trying to originally use it as like, okay, what are the like really great lessons that the script does? And I feel like it's hard. And again, like you were saying, Alex, maybe it's because of how it's executed, but the the plot and the kind of overall construction of the story, I feel like isn't a great case for a, a clear example of how to do this thing well. Like it's not an accessible example of a lot of the lessons. And so that's kind of why the video ended up being more about this is how you make a neo-noir sci-fi movie. Like this is why it's about noir. Um, but I think there are interesting things in the script. I feel like you have lots of things to say. Um, I don't know. I, I think where the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I, I obviously do. And I, I could talk about this movie for four hours very easily, which I won't. But I think to me, the real triumph of the script is the characters and the way that they interrelate and how they mess with your sense of morality, which is what they're designed to do. Um, and that is something you touched on in the video, where you have, you start off with the very corrupt cop where he's, I, I love MMA. M. Emmett, what is his name? Walsh. Emmett Walsh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> He's always great when you He's need that character. Fantastic, yeah, exactly. I mean, his performance is amazing, but the role's really well written. You instantly understand who this guy is. He's so unlikable. And and so crass and all of this stuff. He's the and cop. Yeah, the, he's like the, the cop. Yeah, that lead in Union Station. Right. You know where he is. That's his. Hang office. on, pal. Yeah. No choice, pal. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> they do a really good job of taking these. They are almost noiry tropes, and marrying them really perfectly with these sci-fi themes of like, what does it mean to be human? It's a really perfect marriage of that where. Think about how easy it would have been to make Batty just evil, right? Or like just this murderer. And he is horrifying, but he and Pris are compelling. Mm -hmm. They're and like And you understand what they want. You like, understand what they want, yes, exactly. But also I want more life. <laughs> Father. Father. <laughs> just not different, what it is not in the what script. It is in the script. <laughs> yeah. But much better. Oh no, it's a, a, a great change of line. Yeah. Yeah. As a little and like annotation note, I feel like that's one of the things that made me iffy about like celebrating the script because I feel like a lot of the most powerful things mm. were improvisations or changes made by the like actors. Tears Ru and rain. Rutger Hauer, the poet, you right? Know, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, just the relationship between him and Pris really makes you question their humanity in a way because it's like you know, in other ways, it could be performative where they're like acting human, where she like is acting human with um. Sebastian, J.F. Sebastian. It's like, well, this is an act, right? She needs to get something from him. So she's affecting to be like this helpless, you know, street person who just needs help. That seems like it's an act. But then when you find out, A, that he knows that she's a replicant and he's like impressed by her and treats her kindly and relates to her, he's so sympathetic and lovely, uh, that character. And the way that I, he... I, I, I make my friends, I build them. I know. <laughs> J.F. Sebastian. He's so good. Is that, her, her performance. Is that William Sanderson? Yeah. yeah. Uh, her performance does change. I, I never really noticed it before, but her performance does change subtly from like pre-Roy to post-Roy yeah. in Sebastian's apartment in a way that's really cool. Mm -hmm. No, that exactly. But so it feels like, again, she's affecting something maybe because we that's the first time we meet Pris is when we see her like sort of calculating, okay, I'm going to hide in this garbage and then I'm just going to be like, oh, I'm helpless. Can you help me? And so immediately we don't trust her. But then that almost doesn't fall away ever. You're, you're right in that there, it is a subtle change, but it's not... Like a 180 where she then becomes this like super villain or right. anything like that. And then she and Roy have like a relationship. Mm -hmm. Like they're in love. It's in <laughs> a mean, way I that mean, nobody else in the movie is. They're in angry kiss love. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But they're replicants. No, absolutely. Like, Hashtag well, noir. Well, here's one thing that <laughs> I've always been fascinated with, with both Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 is like what actually are the replicants mm. because they seem very biological and there's actually a really important biological component in 2049 yeah. about like child rearing or birthing. Mm -hmm. um, and so are they 
androids or are they actually just like genetic clone people like like and I think Blade Runner kind of has it both ways. Like yeah. there are moments where they have enhanced strength and all. Yeah, this stuff, and when she's then... you know she's doing a bunch of backflips and flipping around, there's almost kind of a mechanical whir sound associated with it. But at the same time, they're very fleshy, organic. When they're killed, when they're shot, they're just killed like humans are. So it's a, it's really interesting because the movie is very ambiguous about what they actually are in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I would venture to say that's purposeful, although now I'm ca- cautious about ambiguity being purposeful. <laughs> 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 I got I got shot down pretty hard in The Shining by trying to suggest that that was oh, that was purposeful. But there I is I think it's purposeful in The Shining. I'm with you. Thank you. But there is some like they don't ever want to tell you whether or not he's a replicant, you know, Deckard is a replicant because they do want it to be ambiguous. And I think these moments that we're highlighting between the replicant characters, they want to they want to make you ask that question because that's what the movie's about thematically. What does it mean to be human if you have these memories and they didn't necessarily happen to you? Does that mean that they're not real in some sense that matters, right? If we're using our memories to construct who we are and to like basically live our lives day to day our memories play this like foundational role so even if they didn't actually happen if they are comprising your personality who's to say that they're not real in that sense? yeah memories are nothing other than what they currently are in your head at this moment right, right. exactly which and is why they're mostly wrong actually which is, ter- <laughs> which is terrifying it is really terrifying <laughs> nobody comes away from this movie going feeling great about their memories or <laughs> right. dreams or childhood memories especially well but i think it's still just really interesting that this movie makes a choice to never really give us like the terminator moment of like underneath the skin they're actually robot it, right it's like mm-hmm. they're just as far as we can tell they are just flesh like that really is it yeah and i think that's what's compelling about the question of whether deckard's a replicant at the end or not and which is not even answered in 2049 like Mm -hmm. it's the it's not michael okay we'll talk about it i promise it's not all right which is the point of the movie is that it doesn't matter you know it's, I think, about like Fight Club or something. It's like, oh, how did he shoot himself in the face? You've but then mentioned kinda, this before. I think I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, well, the point isn't how that actually happened. The point is that he was able to exercise this, you know, Tyler Durden demon. And I think that that's the same thing that Blade Runner does. And so does 2049 is say, well, it does. It's not. that's not important. And I like that 2049 just shows you that Ryan Gosling is a replicant at the beginning just to say I really appreciate that choice yeah, too. Like like we're just rolling with this idea that there isn't a difference, you know. Um and then of course ironically his journey in that movie is to try to find out if his right. memories are are real. Yeah. Well and what a cool choice to start Blade Runner forty nine with the idea that a replicant could also be a Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. Like that they would of course get a next model replicant to do the job that humans used to have to do because they won't complain about it or whatever. You know, like that idea of we use them for everything else. Why not use them to kill each other? That's like the noirist choice to like start off with 2049. I love it. Yeah, that, that movie, the, the first like act, especially when it was, it was setting up everything, I was just so happy. And mm-hmm. I was like, yes, yes, this is what I want. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm like trying not to talk about it because I don't want to have to stop. Right. I just... <laughs> I, I got to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I remember sitting in the theater and like the lights coming down and like the beginning happening. And I felt like transported into a theater in 1982, like what it must have been like to see the original Blade Runner and experience that awe and the music coming in. And I feel like it's perhaps the most like faithful sequel ever. Like, like, how do you make a sequel to Blade Runner, but then you just did it, and that's insane. You make a movie that feels like it doesn't belong in 2017 the same way that Blade Runner didn't feel like it belongs in 1982. And that's what I was saying, whether it's Dr. Sleep or Dark Fate or whatever, is like when you make a sequel to a 30-year-old movie that sort of changed everything and it just looks like a normal 2019 movie, right off the bat, you're you're failing. And I think that's what I appreciate so much about 2049 was that it it doesn't feel it feels like what it feels like in 2017 what blade runner felt like in, in 1982 that sort of like this doesn't exist in any time you know right it's got a timeless quality to it mm-hmm. that something's a little bit off but yeah. in a good way and i think part of that has to do with the again the characters at the heart of the story because the parts i really love 2049 but the parts of it that don't work for me are some of the more um 
yeah, like comp- very obviously computer animated kind of like, or I really like all the risks that they took with like where they pushed the technology to in that movie. But those parts don't work as well for me as this, you know, the Ryan Gosling's character's name's Kay or Joe, I suppose, later on <laughs> in the movie, which is just an insane choice. But <laughs> but his story of trying to figure out who he is, that is the oldest like human story like searching for that identity and so that's where 2049 to me is just like perfect and amazing and then some of the i think some of the sci-fi choices that they have in there that are very computer technology animation dependent some of them work better than others but i'm gonna be here for it all day because what you did is you took the themes from blade runner and you updated them and translated them into the that crisis that we are all in like right now still i don't know it's br- it's beautiful also it's gorgeous oh yeah yeah like i want to <laughs> yeah. watch it right now on well, michael's I- nice tv <laughs> it was, let's watch it on this tv <laughs> i remember when i first heard that denis Villeneuve was uh directing it and i thought oh i like i like his the movies i've seen of his and they're all really compelling but they're also really like kind of long and overwrought a little bit and then i went <laughs> Oh my God, that's exactly what I want from, from a Blade Runner that's, sequel. You're making the Blade Runner sequel. That's what you want. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And now Dune, which I'm just like, I, I want a Dune movie that looks Me like too. Blade Runner 2049. I, I feel like his his path is the correct path. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. He's all, doing it right. It's all doing yeah, the right thing. 1000%. Jumping back really quick. So I think it, that's such a, I'm glad you brought that up, Alex, that the idea of we never really get a clear sense of what they are, what the... Mm-hmm. You know, are the, how mechanical are they? Are they mechanical at all? Are they just right. like genetically engineered down to like a cellular level? Like, what are they? Because, and and I think like you guys were all saying, like I think that's that's really important in order to be able to explore the theme for as long as you can with Blade Runner. Whereas like something like Ex Machina, where it's like very clearly right. this is not a human, and we kind of it's the same kind of question, but it's a different context, and so that kind of it's less about you asking, am I a human? Like, I feel like there's more, I don't know, it's, it's just an int- a different way to explore it. So it, I think it's really cool that it is vague. But okay, so one of my problems with 2049 was I felt like the whole idea that Harrison Ford got that old. They never, oh. they never, they never said he's a Nexus 6. We don't know that replicants don't age. But I feel like other, the, the whole, other replicants like, don't age. Don't all know. we know is that Nexus 6 models have a four-year lifespan. That's all we know. That's what know. Ridley. Well, uh, so we, as we all know, Ridley Scott fully believes that Deckard is a replicant, right? And has said so many times. Harrison Ford, on the other side of it, fully believes Deckard is human. That's great. I love that. Yeah. And Ridley Scott said, "Well, he's not an Nexus Six, so who knows how long he can live?" Like that's what he said. I guess for me, the but I agree with you that the aging is. The aging is weird, and I feel like the power of the the theme and the idea that he and Rachel had a child, like I felt like mm. th- that's it's, it's only more, interesting yeah. to me if it's a human and a replicant creating something new, or yes, if it's just like yes. oh, two replicants can make more replicants. That doesn't have the same weight, and so I think I I bought in really hard to the oh, humans and replicants. Maybe this is evidence that we are more similar than we thought. But if Deckard's a replicant, then it's not as compelling to me anyway. That sounds I, pretty I, prejudiced, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm two with, replicants. Who cares? <laughs> well, I, but I'm, I'm with you. I think it, I think it's a much more interesting uh, plot twist for a human and a replicant to have created a sure. new, new life together. Like Agreed. that That's a much more interesting storyline than... No, I'm in the Harrison yeah. Ford camp here. I, want, I think Deckard is human. That's where I lean mm. on this argument. Because again, yeah, it's exactly for the reason that you guys are saying. So so this raises two really interesting questions about sort of canon and Ooh, that yay. kind of stuff. One of which is that in the voiceover, the end, he says... We're never going to get away from this voiceover. Because I think God it's so it. fascinating. It is fast. He says, uh, Gaff had been there and he'd let her live. Four-year lifespan, he, he figured. He was wrong. Uh <laughs> Tyrell told me that she was special. No, no, uh, you know, expiration date or whatever. So God, what, if, a, what a weak right, <laughs> like but, way to think. To but <laughs> if the voiceover that was written not by the screenwriters but was put in the theatrical edit of your movie says that she doesn't have, you know, a, like, is that canon? Is that not? Right. If, if everybody except, and th- that's one question. Question number two, if let's say both screenwriters, Harrison Ford, everybody in the world, 
says, I don't believe Deckard's a replicant, but Ridley Scott, with his final say, edits it in a way where he clearly is a replicant, where I'm not saying he the, it, he clearly is in the final cut, but I'm saying, theoretically, if he edits it in a way where he clearly is, then is that canon? You know, it like the, theoretically, the director has the final say over what is or what isn't. Uh, but I don't know. Like, it's a question. Well, it, that like we could get really into uh-huh. the weeds <laughs> on this so in terms many of things. like what constitutes yeah. <laughs> canon. But I will say just really quickly that in Blade Runner 2049, she dies in childbirth in 2021. So it's very that's within her four year lifespan. Right. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't actually resolve any of that, right? Yeah. So she she dies in childbirth. Da, 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 would she have continued to live for however long? Who knows? Um, well, because Ridley Scott produced 2049 and he doesn't believe the thing that the narrative says. So I don't think that that's canon. I just think it's an interesting question. I it think, is an interesting question. I think canon, in, in the case of something like this, where it isn't textually established... I feel like you can kind of mess with it. Like, mm. I, I like this. And and as we said, he very easily could have done that. He could have settled it one way or the other. You know, he happens to believe what he believes, but he didn't. He left it ambiguous on purpose because he, like, again, was leaning into this theme of blurring these lines about what makes us human. I respect that as a choice. To me, that's the only thing that is canon is that, like, we don't know. Mm-hmm. And I think the idea of what is canon in general, how we define it is a fascinating thing that I think we should save for when we talk about Star Wars a little bit later. Oh, we really sure. need Coming to. Up. I think Coming there's a lot soon. of things to talk about oh, surrounding boy. that. Speaking of Star Wars, I just want to say how much I appreciate how sort of understated and vulnerable Harrison Ford's performance is in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Considering it was between like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Return of the Jedi. Like yes. the fact that he gives such a non Harrison Fordy performance. And he's sort of like the weakest character in the movie in terms of like being noticeable in the sense that like that's what a lot of leading characters are. They're just sort of the person going through this thing. So it's I didn't even notice it until maybe like the fifth or sixth time I watched the movie. I'm like, oh wow, he's giving this really amazing performance that you don't notice the first time you're watching it because you're not supposed to because he sort of takes such a backseat to the other characters. Yeah, it's interesting. He's playing kind of this classic hard-boiled detective but he doesn't have this like physicality to him where he like has to throw his weight around a lot. Mm. Like he is almost very like he makes himself smaller. Think of himself like think of Harrison mm-hmm. Ford wedging himself into that little seat at that counter with the noodles, right? He kind of is just like making himself small and sort of trying to avoid being noticed in a way. He gets his ass kicked a lot too. Like mm-hmm. yeah, like well, not... private detectives do tend to get their asses right. kicked like a decent amount. Right. But yeah. But yeah, it, it's cool how much you leaned into it, kind of to your point, Brian, of like being in between these two heroic like figures that he was playing, like going completely the opposite right. direction with this. I feel like is part of why this movie is so, you know, why we still remember it and talk about it. It adds a lot to it. Yeah. He's also kind of the king of like looking like he's suffering. Like <laughs> yes. even in Indiana Jones or Star Wars or whatever, like when he is like going through something, he just doesn't hold back in his performance and he just looks like, you know. Which he like, just looks like he's in hell yeah. at every moment, which, which is so sexy. It's so... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, sorry, what? Well, yeah, want to <laughs> repeat that sentence? Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's such a critical thing, like for a lead actor to be able to do like I I feel like actors that are too concerned about always looking cool like you want to be able to see the the hero get to that low point and have that vulnerability because if not vulnerable then you don't care about what's going to happen to them and I feel like he's such a great example of someone that can goes like he looks ridiculous some of the times when he's being strangled or like you know all those things anyway he's really good yeah I mean those things there he absolutely does not win that fight with Roy. There no, is like, right. he no, really dead. does not. Yeah. Roy saves his life. Like, just like Raiders of the Lost Ark, if the protagonist didn't exist, the movie would be basically the same. <laughs> like, they would still just die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that about, everything about his performance is really amazing in this and and the way that he carries himself and how stuck he is and how trapped he is. And, and there's this 
oppressive feeling to the whole thing where it feels like everyone's kind of in their own private cage or prison and they're trapped and and all of that stuff Harrison Ford is like another great his character Deckard is another great example of somebody who feels very trapped in his life he gets trapped into doing this job which he doesn't want to do he gets trapped into like almost trapped into this uh romance with Rachel which is its own conversation (laughs) but like trapped into like stuck basically in in a way that you it helps to create sympathy for the replicants because they are actively trying to get out of their situation they're actively seeking something better and different and Deckard is absolutely not he just wants to be left in peace but he's so stuck I don't know it's great it again blurring those lines and real quick the last thing I want to say is that Sean Young as Rachel also gives this very delicate performance but the thing I know her from growing up is from Ace Ventura Pet Detective, uh-huh. where she plays the hard ass yeah. lieutenant, lieutenant who yeah. turns out to be the trans <laughs> ex kicker of the Miami Dolphins, because that's what movies were in the 90s. Yes, oh my God. <laughs> that's her? Einhorn. Oh Rachel is Einhorn. Oh my God. I'm glad I never saw these movies. <laughs> that was 90s. That wasn't 80s. But Blade Runner was. Early 90s is almost more 80s they than really, the 80s. They really, truly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we go around and talk about what lessons we're going to take from Blade Runner. Alex, do you want to start us off? We already kind of really talked about mine, but I think it's just the reminder that if you put... like This movie is such an overachiever when it comes to production design. <laughs> like, it did so much more than it needed to. Like, there's there are so many scenes yes. where, where, once again, my brain is confused because, like, it's not plot important what I'm being shown, but it's, I'm being shown anyway. And it's just... And the Ennis house. They shot it in the Ennis house. Yeah. And it's like and, and, incredible. And the thing I mentioned earlier where it's just like on repeat viewings, I'm, I feel like I'm seeing a new movie. I'm like, wait, this is also in this movie? I don't remember this amazing place and this and these props and costumes and details. Like, what? This is in this movie too? Neon Umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's basically just a reminder that uh, it's worth it. Like, if you're making if you're making a good movie that's worth watching again... Um, it's worth it to to go the extra mile with production design and to just give give it's a visual medium give us something to look at when we watch it again that's going to be new and fresh and make it feel like a new movie every time it's it's really remarkable that this movie like most movies i see this many times i have it kind of memorized in my mind and and i i'm like oh yeah i like this scene and i, I know the scene exactly this movie it's not that way it, it feels like a new movie every time i watch it which is almost magical i don't know how it does that yeah totally trisha i'm just gonna go back to like having a driven protagonist uh i really appreciate that even though it's not internally driven for him he's kind of being dragged through this case a little bit where but he does get fascinated by it it's really interesting because and actually the device by which he is trapped into it is not actually clearly explained he's just like you have to wait i have to yep (laughs) (laughs) okay now i guess he's gonna do it um which is really awesome but he does get like fascinated and wrapped up in it so so much so that that scene where he's just like like I said, zooming in on that picture for like, it seriously feels like it's 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you want to see what he's going to see. You want to puzzle it out the way that he is trying to puzzle it out. And so his drive seeps into you as an audience member where you get engaged because he's engaged and because of he has a really clear goal and he is trying to solve something. And that's sort of like all mysteries really where it's just like, who killed her? I need to know, you know, that that thing that see you can't walk away from it. It's all like detective procedurals are based on that thing of like, it's their job to solve the thing. I want to see how they solve it. I want to watch them do it. It's a really clear goal. And the twists and turns don't matter as much as watching this character succeed at that goal. And yeah, just no matter how I've been judging a screenplay competition and it's amazing how few characters have goals and are driven. (laughs) So I just want to shout that out as a choice. It's a really, really good basic lesson. Quick, quick note about the enhancement scene. Yeah, watching it again, I was like, "This would be so much easier with like a keyboard and mouse." Like he's having to <laughs> tell the computer things so many like 
45 degrees quadrants over no uh -huh. zoom in there no no five clicks over no up it's, it was like trying to use siri to do anything it's just it was just funny it was i like, like it i like yeah. how they translated that to the drone in 2049 where he's like telling oh, the drone to like zoom around and where to look and stuff yeah it's like smart translation of that technology there's a lot of that in 2049 which is so like smartly done yes <laughs> yeah yeah you can't use a keyboard and mouse and drink whiskey all at the same it's time it's a really good, good point, point. Yeah, yeah. that's why we had voice control yep. yeah what i also like about what you're saying trisha is that like it's, it's he's driven by the goal but like you're saying he's also fascinated by it like it's mm -hmm. not just that he needs to get it done so that he can finish the job it's like there's something like one of my favorite moments is when after he's finished giving the void comp test to rachel and he's talking to What's his name? Tyrell. And he's just completely puzzled by like, how how can she not know what she is? Like, how right. can it not know what it is? And mm -hmm. I feel like that's, you know, that's the question of the movie. Yeah. And you see him like want to know the answer to he's that. He's kind so, of dis disturbed by that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's nice that on multiple levels, he needs to find the answer. Because he doesn't want the case, but then there's something unusual about it, mm -hmm. right? When he hears about it, he's like, why did they come back here? Like, what are they after? Yeah, the, the thing that they're doing is so unusual and mysterious to him and doesn't, like, line up with his idea of the way that these replicants are supposed to act. Yeah, that he just gets enthralled. Yeah. Brian? Uh, so I was thinking about this concept of, of less is more, which is such an easy thing to say, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't know what you're doing, obviously. But I was thinking that the final cut of the movie takes this voiceover and removes it. It removes information from the movie. It removes mm. explanation and it makes for a more compelling movie. As you were saying, Alex, Rutger Hauer took the monologue that was written and removed a bunch of stuff from it. He, he yep. you know, an actor said, I want to say fewer words, in, you know, in my death monologue. And it's become like the most, you yeah. know, like well-known monologue of, of cinema history. And I think I was just thinking that like that does it is the sort of two plus two effect of just when they go to visit the eye maker and Leon reaches in the thing and he looks over and sees that he his hand wasn't, you know, destroyed by putting it in. And he said and then Roy says, Yes, questions. You know, <laughs> like that's they're saying in two words, he's saying like, oh, he realized that he's a replicant. Roy realizes that he realized that and he's saying, yes, we are. And that's why we're here. We need information. You know, like how much is being said with so few words. Yeah. Or like when uh, Deckard goes to visit the the snake maker to find out where, mm -hmm. you know, and the entire scene is from outside the shop <laughs> right. with yeah. like stuff reflecting on the window. The guy's wearing like a fez and some weird cyberpunk stuff and you barely even hear what they're saying and it doesn't matter, but you're so much more compelled by seeing this scene through the window than if it was just like cutting back and forth between these two actors and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think the problem with less is more is people say, oh yeah, it should be confusing, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, <laughs> no, I want the filmmaker to know exactly mm -hmm. all of the answers to all of these questions. I just don't necessarily want them to tell me all those answers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was David Mamet who wrote uh, a play called The Woods that I did in college. And someone said, oh, so what is, you know, what does this mean? Or what is it? And he said, no, no, my part's done. It's your turn now. He was basically saying like, I've put in all the information into the script that I wanted to be in there. And for me to say more would be a disservice to this thing that I created. And I think okay, that's... Dave. I just like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. As someone, sorry, uh, a film that I wrote is going into production really soon. Uh, and Congratulations. I, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really exciting. And so I've been talking with the director and he is actually in certain scenes. He's like, can you write four more lines of dialogue for me in this scene? And I'm like, listen, I really would rather not. Um, he's like, no, we are going to cut it probably. But like, I just want to have that there like to fill it out, basically like to play with it, let the actors play with it. And, and obviously there's different processes of filmmaking. And so like, but you know, he was just like, I'm not saying we're going to use it. Just if you could write it for me so the actors can say it. So just like, yeah, to in case almost like better to have it, not need it and cut it out or whatever. And, and that's kind of, Actually, your point about uh, that Definitely. speech at the end with Roy, it's like there was a speech written and then he they he cut out a bunch of it and rewrote a bunch of it. Mm -hmm. But there was still like more of it on the page. And so sometimes like having it on the page helps the actor go through the process and helps the director go through the process and whatever. And then later on, you can see, oh, let's exercise all of this because we absolutely don't need it. Now, it's not the way that I would work, but it is the way that 
a lot of our films, we, we've talked about this many times. There was a lot more on the page or there were all these scenes that got cut. We turned out not to need them, but that was part of the process. Well, and I think the less is more thing makes for a more repeatable viewing film. Like, mm-hmm. like I think a movie where that scene in the snake shop is shot very clearly with shot reverse shot and we hear everything they're saying and it's like a drawn out scene of information wouldn't be fun to watch tons of times Mm -hmm. but instead we're treated to a single shot that's an interesting frame with things happening in the foreground and it's not about what they're saying even and that's enjoyable on the fifth viewing right so it's it's almost like your choice you're making of a lot of people might not like this experience the first time but maybe it'll be more have more longevity in a way. Yeah, I, I feel like my thought on less is more, which kind of also transitions to the lesson I feel like I'm walking away with at the moment. But I, I kind of think about it like the goal isn't, like you're saying, it's not to not provide the information for the audience, but it's for the goal is to make the information, the pieces connect in the mind of the viewer is how I think about it. Because film, that's kind of the only way you can like ignite the imagination of the film goer and i am thinking about film language and the kuleshov effect which is you know when you cut between one shot and another shot the brain wants to make a connection and it's in that connection that you are enjoying yourself that's that's when you are activated as a viewer and i feel like that's kind of how i see the goal of less is more is construct things with the right information in the right places so that it gets put together in the mind of the audience such that they're enjoying themselves and not just being read a list of information kind of a thing. And so and so sort of talking about film language, that's the thing I've been thinking a lot about also and how it's evolved and how it's changed. And what you were saying, Brian, about both Dark Fate and Blade Runner 2049 doesn't feel like a 2017 movie. Mm-hmm. It feels like a movie of this other time. And the original Blade Runner doesn't feel like an 80s movie, which is why I think I can like it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jab. Um, <laughs> you can't say jab. <laughs> that, that, negates, the jab. that negates the jab. <laughs> I can say jab. This is my noir. He just made a jab, y'all. That's a thing I'm coming to appreciate a lot is filmmakers that take the time to not just make the standard version of the movie. Mm. And like even the, like the standard movie can be good, but rather like taking the time to look at all the tools available in the filmmaking toolkit and put them together in a unique way to tell this story i feel like is those are the films that we remember and kind of stand the test of time because they are kind of outside of the language of that time they're kind of speaking this other language that we can always go back to and access and i don't know it's kind of a it's still kind of a a mushy thought in Mm -hmm. my head i know what you're saying though that there are movies that i I see where it's like this is of this year even right and just even there's like cultural references in it that are like expiring already yeah yeah and it just feels like okay well this is done now like this movie can't live much past this moment in time and there's other films that feel yeah timeless and they're already just existing in this liminal space of where did this come from it's not from here would you say Mm -hmm. those other films get lost like tears in rain time to go Sure. <laughs> really quick. What's everyone been watching? Brian. Uh, I went and saw Jojo Rabbit, the new hey. uh, Holocaust comedy <laughs> <laughs> from Taika Waititi, um, where Taika plays an imaginary friend, Hitler, um, to, <laughs> to the young boy who is a Nazi enthusiast. And it's just lots of feel good fun. It's his first movie post Thor Ragnarok. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to see what like budget taika is like and it's oh like, yeah it has the spirit of hunt for the wilder people and what we do in the shadows but it looks like a west A- like it looks like if wes anderson made inglorious bastards Interesting. <laughs> yeah. every time i see it that, i'm like wait is this moonrise kingdom oh no this no. is something it, it else. really felt that, like that makes me interested moonrise kingdom so, at nazi camp yeah mm-hmm. so did you like it i loved it uh sam rockwell's in it rebel wilson alfie allen stephen merchant uh thomas and mckenzie who's great she was in uh, leave no trace a couple mm-hmm. years ago with scarlett was, johansson uh, and then yes thank you uh <laughs> scarlett johansson who is amazing in this movie like she's one of those people who she, I've been seeing her in movies since 2001, whenever Man Who Wasn't There came out. And I, she's fine. 
Like I just like, she's never been a negative in a movie for me, but for whatever reason, I'm just like, she's also here, you know? And this was the first time where I was just like, wow. Like I am, I was blown away by her, her performance. It's also a very charming character, a very well-written character, but she just knocks it out of the park. And then a few days later, I saw Marriage Story in which she's also great and go see Marriage Story also. But uh, yeah, Jojo Rabbit, great. Awesome. Cool. Trisha. I saw Parasite which is really good. It's just like a really, really well-made film. Um, Alex is not a you saw it, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. It's a Korean filmmaker who made Okja and Snowpiercer and The Host. Um, just like one of the greatest filmmakers we have today in terms of just really visionary, has this really just razor sharp take on, on the things that he wants to say. And it's a super contained story. It is really funny and really upsetting and just like boiling with like resentment. Um, and it's just really good. Um, yeah, it's an amazing drama and it's surreal and, and uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. I was just, yeah, yes. I basically had, <laughs> I basically had my hands clenched yeah. the entire time. And I was just like, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to be watching this because I know how badly it's going to go. And but it's amazing. Um, so, yeah, Parasite. Phenomenal. Check it out. Awesome. Alex. So I saw an advanced screening of Dr. Sleep, mm -hmm. um, which it was kind of fun to watch after our Shining podcast and talking about all that. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> one thing we talked about with The Shining was how it's so different from the Stephen King novel. And so Dr. Sleep is this interesting example of it's the Stephen King, you know, sequel to The Shining, which is a very different novel than movie, but we're making a movie. So it's got to feel like a sequel to the movie Shining, which is not the same. Anyway, I think someone mentioned that on The Shining. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel yeah. like somebody said something about it. <laughs> anyway, so that that's very evident in this movie. <laughs> it's really interesting because there's, there's an aspect of the film that I just really enjoyed where it just felt like it was in a, it was a, just a very different Stephen King story. And it just felt like I'm fine with this. Let's just do this. This is a very completely different movie than the shining. And it's kind of fun. It's almost like, it was almost like a highbrow twilight, you know, like it was just like, okay, it was, it was like kind of goofy. <laughs> It was like goofy, fun, like supernatural stuff with like Rebecca Ferguson well, being. Says, I do love her. Yeah, Rebecca Ferguson just being like a fun, evil person, and great. It was just like it was pretty goofy, but I was enjoying myself. And then they kind of come full circle with like all the shining stuff and try to like recreate shining moments with like lookalike actors and. Oh boy. Just like no, like I was really like just down for this other movie, but now you're trying to do it all and it's not working for mm. me. So that's what I walked away feeling was like I was I was open to this other Stephen King thing. But when you try to make it the shining again and it's the tone is so different and the you know, we talked about the shining being ambiguous. Like this movie has so many rules and they're so clear okay. and, they're, and it's like it's like fantasy like world rules it's so different from the kubrick vision <laughs> so anyway it's it felt both uh fun and more enjoyable than i thought and also kind of sacrilegious and wrong <laughs> at the same time <laughs> was my experience of dr sleep great yeah. michael uh so i finally just finished uh flea bag yeah uh, kind of late to the party <laughs> And technically, Alt Shift X has already recommended this on the podcast. So, but I'm, I, it, I'm gonna do it too because it's it's really good. It resonated with me kind of for the same reasons I've been talking about of using film language to do new things and mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's a version of it that could be a very standard thing, but you know, they looked at the tools that were on the table and were like, we're gonna pick them up and we're gonna use them in this completely other way. And it it, it was the first time in a long time I've watched something where I wasn't, I didn't have my analytical mind on. And the moments that I tried to turn it on, I was like, I don't know how they're doing this. It's just so good. <laughs> I don't understand. Um, so I highly recommend it. I'm definitely going to watch it again and probably again and again uh, to try to understand all the reasons it's so good. But it's really, really good. And it's the kind of good that gives me hope for the world. Mm -hmm. And Bond 25. Uh-huh. I'm so excited. Oh, wait, because she... They hired her to work on Pump 25. That's Yay! Amazing. <laughs> I'm so excited. Amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yes. I just started season two. I'm really late to the party. Oh. And okay. the first episode of season two, I was like, I get it. I get it. Yeah. This is so good. Like, we could do an episode just on that. Ooh. 
We no should. promises. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Got to figure out how they do it first. Yeah. I'm really sad that she's just like, no, I'm I'm good with how season two ends. I'm done. I'm so happy that but, that's but what. Then, that but, that's, then we, but then we see what else she gets to do now. I know. Yeah, I and more. like no spoilers, also. But yeah. I, yeah, I feel like I always like it when artists are like, "No, that was enough," because people don't do that. And I, gonna, I agree. She's just... gonna pick something else up, like Bond Twenty Five, and <laughs> but lots of other things, and mm-hmm. do lots of other really cool things. So that's what I'm excited about. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yay. Cool. Well, this has been our episode on Blade Runner. Thank you very much for listening. We recently, as we mentioned during the recording, uh, recorded an episode on Dark Fate. That is Ter- Terminator. Terminator. Dark Fate. Dark Fate. Uh, the sixth or third Terminator movie, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Uh, and that is available to patrons, patrons of Beyond the Screenplay. Uh, if you want to become a patron, the link is in the show notes below. We would certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.